Good evening, everybody. This, I think, is, the, is a special session we have today. It's not only Stefano, one of our three co-authors who is uh, giving a presentation, but the topic as well is a special one, I guess. He will talk about what is always lying a little bit subdued underground, one can say, and which I call, which the Freudian call meta psychology. So he gives us, he will give us a, a glimpse into the future, I think until his retirement when he is 75 or 80. Um, uh, the agenda for 2050. And Stefano is, uh, has two master degrees. Uh, uh, one as one in socio sociology and from the University of Cambridge, and uh, one from literature and philosophy from the University of Milan. And he is now <clears throat> writing his PhD thesis at the University of Essex with our next speaker on the program, Roderick Main. Um, and he's not only a father of three beautiful girls, but also in his young age, uh, author of three books. He's a prolific writer. I think handing over a book every year, that's quite an achievement, I must say. Besides his uh, private practices, he has to run as well. Stefano, it's all yours. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Paul and Bernard, for allowing me to share my thoughts tonight. This is something we were looking into last year. Actually, last year, I was uh, thinking to present a paper titled Psychoanalysis of the Fall of the Berlin Wall, because we are in November and the Berlin Wall fell in November 89. But then uh, I decided that this topic might be more appropriate. Uh, so happy to see so many friends tonight. And I know this topic it's a little bit ambitious and very much inflated. So apologize, uh, I apologize. Um, let's start. There are many ways to be Jungian or to be a Jungian. And this is very good news. It signifies that analytical psychology is alive and reflects the continuing interest in, as well as perhaps even rejuvenation of Jung's theory at the beginning of the 21st century. Let me share with you what you could expect from tonight. I will start with looking into the concept of the new ancestors. And I promise you I'm not advertising my two volume books titled Anthology of Contemporary Classics in Analytical Psychology, The New Ancestor published by Routledge that is in print right now will come up on the birthday of my third daughter, Carlotta on the 18th of March, 22. Having introduced the concept of new ancestor within analytical psychology, I wish to bring a finalistic look at the future and ask, what is the task of my generation? Which is the agenda 2050 for analytical psychology? I feel the answer lies in the following idiosyncratic steps. One, a Jungian psychosocial relational model. Two, being or becoming culture critic social critics as much as personal therapists. The neo-Jungians. Four, time for extroversion, because extroversion is not bad and is not superficial. Five, medicine contra the soul. Six, the new myth of analysis, eros, integrity, and psychagogia. Let's start with the new ancestor. Who are exactly today's Jungian ancestor asked Andrew Samuel when endorsing my book titled Breakfast at Kuznach. He answered, not really Jung von Franz, Neumann, Jacobi, Hillman, Forman, Fordham, he answered. And continued, well, of course, we all read them, but ancestor change. The analyst who studies under those giants are, if not today's giants, at least already ancestor in their own right. This is the basis from which I developed the idea of such book and ask myself, who are the new ancestors from my generation 
of newly certified analysts. Of course, ancestor is a controversial term, and maybe we have to distinguish between mentors, ancestors, and elders. I propose that mentors are personal and that the mentor and the mentor mutually attract each other and benefit from the relationship. Without this precondition, there is no mentor-mentor relation. Take, for example, Plato and Socrates, and Jung and Freud, which was certainly a mentoring relationship while it lasted and became for Jung an ancestral relationship only after Freud's death. Therefore, ancestors, I propose, are collective and belong to the whole community, the family. You cannot choose an ancestor, it is there. I propose that the above mentioned ancestor by some was are the ancestor of the previous generation, his generation. Therefore, the question is, who are the ancestors of my generation, the neo Jungians, and the next generations, who are the new ancestors? Another important aspect, very important aspect, as Verena cast underlined in the preface of my book, Breakfast at Kuznach, is that we should reflect deeper on the figure and symbolism of the Jungian analyst. And that if and when doing so, we can feel and discern a common basic attitude. Important is also to underline that Jung should not be taken as a messiah who already said everything there is to say, and that the Jungians as a cult. This would arm our field. Apart from celebrating the new ancestor within analytical psychology, my book and this evening wishes to bring a finalistic look to the future and ask, what is the task of my generation? Which is the agenda 2050 for analytical psychology? I feel the answer lies in the following points. Let's start with the Jungian psychosocial relational model. One important detail, this, this paper was presented at the, at the European Congress in, in, in Berlin last summer, and it's a one hour, a one hour uh, paper. So I, I, I had to cut it to fit it into our psychosocial Wednesday, Wednesday slot. So I apologize for this, but I hope you will understand what I'm trying to define. In my PhD work, employing the pioneering survey uh, of the reach of analytical psychology offered by Ira Progrov, I showed the first element that makes of Jung a pioneer of psychosocial studies, and thereby the fact that Jung perceived that, quote from Progrov, the human psyche cannot function without a culture, and no individual is possible without society. Moreover, Jung's quote, makes it, it makes it his principle that all analysis must start from the primary fact of the social nature of man. This is very important. Let's look at Jung and the relational. I'm offering you flesh, fleshes more than in-depth um, comments. As noted by Samuels, Jung asserted that since analysis was dialectical, involved mutual transformation through a therapeutic relationship, its method was necessarily dialogic and would have to include the emotionally charged interactions between the therapist and the patient. Samuels, in an unpublished uh, paper from 2012, notes that analysis, according to Jung, is quote, an encounter between two psychic holes in which knowledge is used only as a tool. Therefore, with Harry Stack Sullivan's idea that mind always emerges and develops contextually in the interpersonal field, and with Greenberg's and Mitchell's assertion that there is not such a thing as either the patient or the analyst, only the patient and analyst unit I would make also of Jung and uh, a relational psychoanalyst until literal. Let's look at the concept of kultur critic. Some will suggest that within both the microcosm of an individual and the macrocosm of the global village, we are floated by psychological themes and that politics embodies the psyche of people. Does it remind us that the founder of psychoanalysis, 
felt themselves to be social critic as much as personal therapist. And in this respect, he recalls Freud, Jung, Maslow, Rogers, Pearls, and the Frankfurt School. Reich and Fromm, not including them in the Frankfurt School for obvious reasons. He also notes that in the 90s, psychoanalysts such as Susie Orbach, Claudette Kulkarni, and Stefan Frosch began to consider society once more, but notes that although the project of linking therapy and the world is clearly not a new one, very little progress seems to have been made. Thus, Andrew stresses that today more therapists than ever want psychotherapy to realize the social and political potential that its founders perceived in it, but is aware of the large gap between wish and actuality. I propose that the Jungian relational psychosocial model might fill this gap. In contrast to Hillman, Samuels actively demonstrated how useful and effective perspective de derived from psychotherapy might be in the formation of policy, in new ways of thinking about the political process and in the resolution of conflicts. He claimed that our inner worlds and our private lives are real from the impact of policy decision and the existing political culture. The COVID pandemic is an example. In considering why policy committees do not include psychotherapists, Samuel notes that you would expect to find therapists having views to offer on social issues that involve personal relations. This is Samuel's most innovative aspect to see psychoanalysts as well as individuals as activists with a fundamental role to play within society. I propose that we should work both within and outside of the consulting group as a successful consultant for politician, organization, activist group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also to regain the quid we inherited, although didn't enact, of the founder of psychoanalysis, social critics and, and personal therapists, becoming again an a new culture critic. We might be able to continue to play or to play a new a role in the development of 21st century society. In 2020, I developed the concept of neo-Jungians that follow the post-Jungians. The neo-Jungians are the third generation of Jungians, being the first generation, the one between 61 and 85, called initially the Zurich School and later the Classical School, and the second generation being between 85 and 2011. So the new Jungians from 2011 onward. The new Jungians employ Jung in a new fashion, along with other schools and tradition of psychoanalysis and beyond psychoanalysis, which mutually contaminate and enrich each other. The new Jungian encompassing eclecticism and integration aim to restore and enhance Jung's work and analytical psychology at the core of depth psychology by studying the psyche as plural. This new approach is constituted by an heterogeneous, international and multicultural diverse group of scholars who on the one hand base their work on the teachings of Jung and the post Jungians, while on the other hand have opened their investigation beyond analytical psychology. Therefore, the neo-Jungians are able to balance the teachings of Jung and the post-Jungians with those teachings coming from other schools and tradition, both within and beyond psychoanalysis, in a mutual and plural enriching exchange. In fact, contemporary neo-Jungians can be linked, although not limited, to relational and post-relational psychoanalysis, feminist psychoanalysis, the intersubjective approach, psychosocial study, culture study, just to name you. The neo-Jungians look at psychoanalysis through the enlarging lenses of what I call the Jungian relational psychosocial model, which is the following. One, it connects theory and clinical work, although they are not the same. It is transdisciplinary. It is pluralistic and inclusive. 
It starts from the premise that the individual is born into a set of social and psychoanalytical circumstances, as Susie Lorbach underlined. It investigates the ways in which psychic and social processes demand to be understood as always implicated in each other, as Stephen Frosch suggested. It has an emphasis on affect, the irrational and unconscious process, often but not, not necessarily, necessarily understood psychoanalytically, again, as Frosch underlined. It offers a conflict relational approach and stresses the need for continuous adaptation in the process of becoming who people authentically are, as Orbach underlined. Becoming, as Watkins underlined, who people authentically are, becoming who people authentically are, is seen not as development, but as liberation. Analysis is framed as accompaniment, again, following Mary Watkins, based on the co-construction and multiplicity of meaning, as R. Gaden and Schwartz underlined. So the task of the neo Jungian is to look at the future. And the first thing to do is to honor and preserve the work the first and second generation of Jungians made. Let's look at extroversion. Jungian mainly stress introversion in their clinical writings, and this has not always been helpful outside our circle. I hope that in the next 30 years or so, some of us, the most extroverted one perhaps, like Bernard, will be able to influence society as culture critic outside our usual circles, presenting our work, although it's not easy, and I know from a personal uh, experience, presenting our work at known Jungian and known psychoanalytic conferences, talking about our approach with pride and courage without inferiority, especially toward the Freudians, at different media outlets, policymakers, and institutions of different sort. Becoming extroverted would be the most innovative aspect. Therefore, following samples would mean to see psychoanalysis as well as individual as activist, having a fundamental role to play within society. Let's look at medicine and the soul or medicine contra the soul. Another point, which is of fundamental importance, is about training analysis and who and how is to be admitted to train with Jungian's Institute around the world. Of course, there are differences between legislation. For example, here in Germany, only psychologists and medical doctor can train. In Zurich, for the international program, everybody is, is invited to apply. Hillman underlines that, quote, Freud soon realized that it was necessary to partially abandon medicine because the analyst does not physically examine his patient, does not prescribe him medicine for organic disorders, he refers it, him, her, to others. In the analyst's office, there are no medical devices. You don't see white coats and black briefcases. I propose that the degree in medicine or psychology are not the prerogative to access psychoanalytic training, but that the criteria enforced at the Cargo Studying Institute in Zurich should be adopt adopted. To write a 10 page autobiography, then to go through six interviews with accredited analysts and going through 300 hours of training analysis parallel during the second half of the training by individual and group supervision. And of course, as an antidromia, have a one or two years long internship in a psychiatric institution. Last, following Samuel's proposal at the fourth Analysis and Activism Conference in San Francisco, 2020, I agree that training to be truly egalitarian should not require a master degree I add, not even a bachelor degree. I know, it sounds crazy. But this is because there are too many inequalities about gaining a degree, bachelor or master. Candidates, I propose, should be interviewed and accepted on the basis of the fulfillment of the above mentioned requirements at the Carl Gustav Jung Institute Zurich, minus the master degree, especially with 
looking at their willingness to train, that means learning the theoretical aspect of this profession and to undergo self-analysis to become a Jungian psychoanalyst. There are so many cases of amazing uh, clinician or theorist that are not psychologists and are not um, medical doctor. Ingrid Riedel, for example, Andrew Samuels, Luigi Zoya, and so many others. Almost at the end of this short presentation, I want to look at what I call the new myth of analysis, and especially look at integrity, eros, and psychagogia. In my paper titled The Fascist Analyst, and the new myth of analysis published by Enkelados from Cipa, Italy. I focused on the meeting and confrontation in the analytical room and the problematic behavior of the analyst. The problematic behavior of the analyst. I employed a fictional clinical vignette that obliged us to look at the concept of integrity and eros. Doing so, I employed Hillman and Bibi and later introduced the concept of psychagogia. Bibi underlines that integrity means literally the stage of being untouched. And he agrees with Robert Grudin that integrity may be defined as psychological and ethical wholeness sustained in time. Integrity is not a painfully upheld standard so much as a prolonged and focused delight. A prolonged and focused delight. For this, Bibi looks at integrity versus violation and proposes that when an individual's own integrity flourishes in a relationship, both patient and therapist share the discovery of the integrity of interpersonal process as well. Then Bibi adds that our society, sorry, our search for the psychological definition of integrity, integrity cannot be cannot be confined to the experience of its pleasure, self-validating thought that pleasure is. Just as frequently, and some might argue more frequently, integrity is located through the experience of violation. We may not even know, B.B. said, we have a self until it becomes anxious or angry, or until the self as being raped. Let's stick to the concept of violation because the above mentioned fictional clinical vignette is about this, a violation. Not a fantasy of violation, as Bibi would say, for, not a fantasy of violation fertile for exploration and best handled by a meta-psychology like Freud's or archetypal psychology like Hillman's, but as their earlier, the earlier Freud recognized and then abandoned, a literal violation that demands concrete response. A literal violation that demands concrete response. On these, Bibi underlines that therapists have to do something to acknowledge when they transgress those boundaries and to atone for the violation of them. The vignette, mention is such a case of known acknowledgement of omitted response by the therapist. Bibi continues claiming that the therapist has three obligations. One, to protect the self-esteem of the client at all costs, even when the client is actively provoking the therapist to endure that self-esteem. Two, to protect the setting or the institution of psychotherapy itself as a place where healing can occur. Three, this would mean, for instance, that a therapist might terminate or not, being a th or not begin a therapy, as in the case of my fictional vignette, but in doing so, rather than blaming the patient, the therapist will make it clear that what has transpired demonstrates only the therapist's present limits, leaving open the possibility that the patient may be able to work effectively with another therapist whose skills and holding capacity are greater or different. 
In the myth of analysis, James Hillman's underlined that, quote, we can see the psyche going into therapy in search for eros, and that we have been looking for love of the soul. He therefore claims that this is the myth of analysis. When the psyche is going into therapy in search of eros, and when we've been looking for love of the soul. In the above mentioned clinical fictional vignette, the patient going to analysis was exactly doing so, although unconsciously, in search for the eros and in search for love of the soul. I propose that this Ilman's Il myth of analysis must turn into the new myth of analysis a 21st century myth of analysis, a return to the research for the eros and to go anew in search for love of the soul. But this will only be possible after recovery, which, as Bibi underlines, if pleasure is the thesis and violation is the antithesis of the psychological experience of integrity, recovery is the sense synthesis. I propose that in 21st century affluent and individualized society, there is a need for a new myth of analysis, and that this is the job of my generation. There is a need for eros versus linear thinking. Eros, according to you, is relatedness. When this will happen, psychagogia, that translate as guide of the soul or soul leading, will be possible. Psychagogia is a companionment of the patient's soul by the therapist, thanks to the art, art of rhetoric. Therefore, the new myth of, of analysis is when the psyche goes into therapy in search of eros and psychagogia, in search for love of the soul through a companionment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefano. That was quite a dense talk you gave us and we have to think into it to come up with intelligent questions. Uh, I propose or we talked it over before that uh, people may raise their hand and then I unmute them so they can talk directly. Before doing nice that. Sense, raise your hand is electronically not just waving. Yeah, yeah. There's a function you can press the button uh, yeah, I have a question to start with. Uh, I read your paper, so I'm quite familiar, a little bit more familiar than most of us here. Uh, you said uh, there is not such a thing as either the patient or the an analyst, only the patient analyst unit. Mm -hmm. um, this, I think, is a new way of looking at it. And uh, can we say that this is some sort of that, that we bring it uh, systemic thinking into psychoanalysis? First, let me clarify, it's not me. It was uh, yeah. Sullivan who said it back in the days. Uh, what I did was to uh, link these with you because you was also saying these with other words. Uh, and the fact that he moved from the sofa to vis-a-vis -vis, uh, session is, is key. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the interesting point is when patients, and this occurs with all the patients, we have bring your own problem. So their problem is also your problem, whether you know it or not. This is the patient therapist uh, relationship that is so deep. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that this is a, it's, it's a, somehow, a, a, at least it's, maybe it's not a new approach, but it's a, an approach which, it's, uh, which you brought, or yeah, which you brought into focus. Yes. Yeah, could be. Well, Andrew is also writing about this since many, 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 many years. What I think is important to be reminded is yesterday night I was with uh, on, on a conversation with colleagues and actually 
they, we were looking into my paper about the fascist analyst, and uh, I was delighted when I heard that they see this um, proposal of looking at the relationship between the analyst and the analysis in different ways, and especially to underline and remind to many, maybe even experienced analysts, that they don't know everything. And mm. this was the case of that clinical vignette. Okay, we have the first raised hand. That is from Eva Pellet. Thank you. Um, so um, my question is, can you um, unfold a little bit the abstract concepts of errors to love of soul? Like how do you imagine errors versus or to Eris movement towards love of soul in the analytical let, dyad. Let me clarify, I intend Eros not with capital E, otherwise we go into possible travel, uh, trouble linked to mythology, but Eros as described, Jung um, in his uh, lecture at Tavistock almost 100 years ago, he said, uh, uh, the most important thing in a relationship is eros, eros as rapport. There are people, there are couples that sleep in the same bed for 50 years and they have no rapport, no relationship. Yeah, Although you sleep in the same bed with someone, there is no relationship. Many of our relationships are like this. There is no eros. There is not that depth today with the passion you are actually talking about this actually with a dream where there were two symbols beers or shots and i asked him what are shots and he said well a shot is something you drink to get wasted to get drunk a beer is actually something related to slow drinking with friends, talking, that is Eros. To be around the table, mm -hmm. to talk with someone. Maybe to be around the table and just be in silence, but be connected deeply and feel the other person and care for the other person. Thank There's you. a very, uh, sorry, let me say something else that I cut because of uh, time constraints. Um, Donald Karshet, uh, he gave an amazing, amazing, keynote speech at uh, Vienna at the World Conference in 2019. And he gave the example that helped me to frame what an analyst should be and what the fascist analyst is not. He was talking about this patient, saying that this patient, uh, uh, her capacity to feel was damaged. She was isolated, she was dissociating. At some point he moved his chair closer and told her, we are here in this together. Your story is not your story, is our story now. Allow me to help you. That is Eros. Steve Myers has a question. Hi, Stefano. Um, hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, this touches on on a subject that we've that you and I have just briefly touched on before, but I it relates to your statement about uh, extroversion, about presenting uh, ideas, Jungian ideas at non-Jungian conferences, which. I think I've mentioned to you that I, I do because I go to, you know, psych psychological conferences and so on. Um, and I've had some very bad reactions when, I, when, I've, when I've been to such conferences, uh, although I've had some good reactions as well. But I think that requires, that sort of extroversion you're talking about requires integrating into Jungian culture first the non-Jungian ideas that are promoted at such conferences as uh, someone once said, you know, we can't influence unless we are subject to influence. Can't, can't think who it was for a moment. But <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I, I just wondered whether you thought that the Jungian 
community was open to, I'll, I'll phrase it in two ways. One is open to learning about non-Jungian ideas, but perhaps more radically thinking in the way that non-Jungians think in order to make that extroverted bridge that you're talking about. Well, this is a political question. I don't want to be kicked out from IAP. Uh, so we'll respond politically, uh, joking, obviously. Of course, yes, not everyone. I mean, to think of the Jungian community as one thing is not accurate. We are many, many people, thousands, and there are people that stick to the classical school, and that's fine. People that are post-Jungian, people that might be plural or neo-Jungian, people that are open to other fields, not only psychological. This is what I try to underline, talking about the concept of the neo-Jungians, you know, this mutual contamination. And there are people that are fine within uh, the classical Jungian framework. I often say, Lake Zurich is amazing, especially in summer. But the ocean is another experience. So you might want to benefit of the lake and you might want to benefit of the ocean. They are mutually contaminating. Um, I also had the experience of going to non-Union conferences. And it was very, very nasty for me. But of course, I had uh, positive um, responses. But the point, as Verena, Verena Cast underlined, you know, she, she always does at the end of the world conference, this dialogue with Freudians. And in Vienna, she underlined, we do the same job, but we do it differently, very differently. So I hope the neo-Jungians, whatever they are, if they are anything, will be open to listen and also courageous enough to bring our knowledge. One very interesting case, uh, and you wrote it in our book, The Plural Turn, when he was working for Tony Blair. He was the in-house psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, and Tony Giddens was the in-house sociologist. Who do you think won? The sociologist, because politicians are closer or more able to understand the way sociologists speak while psychoanalysis is much more difficult. And I think it's the same why Reich and Eric Fromm should not be considered mm, too cool uh, Frankfurt School. They were heretics, like Jung was an heretic for psychoanalysis and then became, became uh, Jung. Anyway, I think Dennis, no, wait a minute. Uh, there are two other questions <clears throat> before I come to Dennis. Uh, one is from Ali Kutskaya. What about 2050? What is the connection of the lecture to for you? Well, it's a programmatic, it's a programmatic uh, plan. Uh, it's the next generation. Mm, 2050, of course, is an important number, mid of the century. Now we are almost 2025. So from a, a time frame is very impossible, is very important. And Andrew always jokes with me, you want to kill us. And I say, no, I don't want to kill you. I want to really thank you, your generation. And I'm very happy that Susan is here tonight. She will be my book, The New Ancestors. And uh, we are lucky that we were able, and we are still able to talk and learn and discuss with uh, what I call the new ancestors. Um, and another thing is my generation, that is really not about age. It's not because I'm 43, but those, um, I mean, Paul and I are the same generation because we studied together. You, Ben, are the same generation, yeah? And uh, it's very important that we bring our voice and uh, Paul bring his voice through musicology and his knowledge. And this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, like a chorus. It's, uh, yeah, what you just said, killing Andrew, uh, is, uh, reminds me of something. Every disciple 
spiritual disciple has to kill his spiritual teacher in the end. Well, maybe, but listen, I, mean, I, I not, 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 think not that literally, that. not literally, but yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, this is the killing of the father and the mother. But for me, it's important to underline what uh, Nancy Robinson Kime told me the first week I, uh, I joined Kuznak for training. She said, Stefano, first read Jung, then read everyone else. This is why I paralleled my study in Zurich first, and one year after my PhD at Essex. Zurich was able to read Jung, the Jungians, and then the post-Jungians, and at Essex, everyone else. As a comment from Altaf, uh... He says, the cost of analysis is itself incredible, incredibly prohibitive. If you're looking to increase diversity, the issue of cost needs to be looked at. This is, uh, uh, this is true. Um, there are institutes that offer scholarship. This is a, a, a small step. Uh, although um, somebody says that the cost of analysis, the financial cost and the life cost has to be undergone. If you resist, if you survive, then you might become an analyst. It is very, very expensive. Analysis, it is still very, very expensive. And I hope that in the next 20, 30 years, um, there will be ways that Uh, students can benefit from scholarship or other ways to train when you can see that uh, there is a good candidate that doesn't have the funds. Dennis? Uh, yes, I'm sorry I lost the uh, connection for a while, so I didn't hear a part of your talk there, Stefano. But um, when you mentioned 2050, It seems like uh, one of the most significant events about 2050 is that's when we have to be to zero emissions. And when you talk about um, uh, getting Jung out into the world, very much Hillman in that regard, uh, and, and talking to where the next generation is at, what about all the, the young people and Greta Thunberg's generation and so on? What do we have to say to them? And I, I I came into Jungian psychology as a biologist, so I've always seen Jung in that manner. And I still think within the Jungian community, we are so ego, uh, egocentrically focused, if you will, on human and human relationships. And I think that the disasters in the environment, as Hillman said, are gonna make us aware we're part of the environment. And I'm thinking that, that the future of psychology is going to be one where we see that we are an integral part of nature and that ecological concept hopefully will trickle down economically, uh, psychologically to how we see our relationships with each other, but a much broader context for Jungian psychology than what we've been working in. I totally agree. And I guess this is one of, uh, if the new, new unions have a DNA is these, uh, opening borders or looking at things from a different point of view. Uh, you and I, I think many of us here are on the analysis and activism list where you know ecological matters, climate change is discussed almost daily. Um, I would put it this way, very provocatively. Um, do we really have the answer? Do we really have the answer as analyst? I don't believe that the world is going to crash I don't believe that as sociologists say the world is out of joint. I believe that the world is spinning in an uroboric way. Winter, spring, summer, autumn, since thousands of years. Yes, there are moments when we feel we're going to crash against the iceberg. And those like the Capitan, those like, those like the captain that was navigating the Titanic to make the re record from England to New York wanted to speed, and that was stupid. His shadow took him, and we know what happened. What am I saying with this? My answer to you is that we have to look at this generation of young 
because they're really young, under 20, amazing, strong people, yeah? That have such an energy, such courage to talk to the world leader and say, you fuckers, do something. I don't think we analysts can do this. Maybe Andrew, maybe Susie. But usually we stay in our room and read our books. My answer is, do we really have the answer? I would say no. This means that we don't have a top-down or huge knowledge about everything that goes on around the world. We need to sit down and work with as many people as possible to try to improve things. And things will develop. Paul? I know I'm nasty. I know you are. You are quite nasty. It's complex for me because um, I, of course, came to Jungian studies quite late. Um, Mm. And I'm already so post-structuralist, so sort of flexible background, uh, so many different things I've done that I tend not to really regard myself as coming from any of those particular structures. I don't know. It's clear that the universe has already changed a great deal. Pardon me, the world, the human world has already changed a great deal. So we're in an internet culture that is heavily, heavily, multiply connected. Everyone really is. Many people are interested in the Jungian work I'm doing at my university, at various groups I belong to. It's no longer essentially contingent on an analytic training as in most organizations. And I think you know that, Stefano, that's what you're talking about. So it's not only a generation of analysts and Jungians, it's also, I don't know, do, here's, uh, I'm being incoherent, you'll pardon me, Stefano. Um, a question that goes back to something um, Andrew said a very long time ago. He said he thought the 21st century would be more Jungian mm -hmm. if the 20th was more Freudian. Now, for me, that also links to Foucault's idea that the 21st century would also be Deleuzean. Deleuze likes Jung, right? And actually the constant increase in people talking about Deleuze and Guattari has actually increased people paying more attention to Jung, as has unfortunately Jordan Peterson, but that's a different problem. So what would you see as good, bad, or indifferent about all of that? For me, I, I see it as flow, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, well, you as post-structuralist, um, as an American, I, I, each yeah. American is post-structuralist, uh, de facto. But the point is, we train in Zurich, and we know that among our generation of trainee, there are people that are super orthodox. Sure. Read, read the book and apply the book. What I am proposing is that this is not possible. Okay. All right. This is not good. Um, I don't know if this will be the century of Jung because we are in 2021 and it seems we already had three different centuries. Twin Towers, the first crack in 2008, 2012, now COVID, for example. So it seems we are going through three centuries. Um, I hope we Jungians, the institution, the Jungians as an institution might be able to bring their knowledge, our knowledge, where it's needed to listen and to add our bit. Maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not needed. That's all I'm trying to, to say. And by the way, from my point of view, I just, I tend to read Jung as though that's always been possible. And I think Jung always yeah. tended to do that. Right. Yeah. When people yeah, project particular structures onto Jung, his relation to things tended to be rather fluid. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one example, I live in Germany and Germany is not big, actually, it's considered bad things. 
in Italy is very popular. You know, uh, there is almost no difference between Jung and Freud. So it's also cultural. Um, but I strongly believe we have something to say and we should say it more and louder. Dennis, you had your hand raised still. Um, actually, I took it down, uh, but um, yeah, I had some response to uh, Paul, I mean, Stefano, and I think I'll just send the link. I gave a, a presentation recently on Jung and the environment from a very Jung, uh, Zurich type way. And it's, uh, I, I don't want to go on in a, a lecture here and about everything I said, but it's a whole construct, an ecological construct of Jungian psychology and, and the environment. And uh, that's, that's all I can say. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment from Ali Götzkaya again. How would you reflect historically to Luciano Mikacci? I hope it's pronounced correctly. Mikacci's view about Freudian psychoanalysis in the context of the modern Jungian path. Uh, this sounds Russian to me. I apologize. Maybe this person can ask the question live because I don't know this Luciano and I don't know what this is. He doesn't raise his hand. Can you repeat the question again? How do I how, see? How would you reflect historically mm -hmm. Luciano Mikacci's view about Freudian psychoanalysis in the context to a modern Jungian path? I don't understand the question. Do you? No. Paul? Bernard? No, I'm sorry. I think we need an explanation of what was said. We don't know what the reference is. Uh, I don't know who Luciano Micacci is. Anyway. Um, Wait, there is a question from Ali. Is that a question from Ali? Yeah. Ah, Ali. Hello. Hi, Ali. Hi, Stefano. Can Hi. You... Yes, yes. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, my question was, um, I was quite disturbed reading the book from this guy. He's an Italian psychoanalyst, I think. And he was like historically uh, summing up some network of psychoanalysts in the last century. And mm. talking about cases of Marilyn Monroe and quite famous people. <laughs> mm. and, Somehow it was all leading to a dead end in mm. their kind of therapy. And I think it was a lot uh, pointed towards the, yeah, to, towards the sexual um, roots of their disturbances. And uh, because you were talking about Eros and, mm. and you psychology, we are separating eros from sexuality, as you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know from you, what could be the difference in our view of Jungian psychoanalysis for, yeah, for the future? I, think. I mean, we could write a book about it. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes. Let me tell you something I've been thinking in the past few weeks. Uh, I've always been interested in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, yeah, so Vienna and what is around. If you think of that time with Franz Josef and even the previous uh, emperor, it was something amazing, really transcultural trans -cultural and transnational, because you have uh, Austria, of course, you have Slovenia, you have Galicia, you have Bohemia, you have Moravia, uh, you have uh, Hungary, of course, you have a part of Romania. And it is said by many authors like Grill Panzer or um, Josef Roth, no one is Austrian. To become Austrian, you have to move to Vienna. Slovenians that move to Vienna, like the Trottas, 
in the book The Radetzky Marsh. Or Green Panzer Freud, family move from Bohemia to Vienna. Karl Kraus, Josef Roth himself. The Habsburg family is a thousand year um, dynasty. But around the birth of psychoanalysis, and it's not because of the birth of psychoanalysis, something started to change. Namely, I would say the lack of Eros and the lack or the death of the feminine. So, the impossibility of the anima. Let's only look at Franz Josef, the emperor. Everyone in the empire was working for the empire and the emperor. Ergebet or Elizabeth Sisi died, I think, in 1898, killed by an Italian anarchist. Important. That is the point from which the empire has no fe female figure, female counterpart. The start of the loss or the lack of the animal. If you look at the book of Joseph Roth, Jewish, from the north, from Leopoldstadt, he writes in the Radetzky March about someone who is a hero um, saving the emperor Franz Joseph from being killed by the Italians. Then this will become a baron. And he will retry, retire from the army because he wanted to be remembered as a hero. But in the school books, the story was falsified because the emperor should be the biggest and the hero should be the second biggest. But this man decided to go away from the army because it, could, it was an honor matter. So it was not honor enough. He spent the rest of his life being a man working in the countryside and taking care of his sick wife. Important. Sissy killed sick wife. Second, um, when this man dies, the son become the baron. He has a kid and the wife dies very early. So the kid grows up without a mom. And the story goes on up to the uh, years before First World War. In the book, he said that to prevent the invasion of the Russian, of communism, so revolution against the order was better to have war. Again, you go to war when there is a lack of the feminine. I would say, or that transformative element that the anima brings. Total lack of eros. From more or less 48 or 58, the Austro-Hungarian army that was amazing, big, strong, was off war. This was problematic, not because there was no war, that's good, but because an army without war will spend the day faking war or having war games, getting drunk, going to, with prostitutes, and losing the culture, the soul. Mm -hmm. That's why the Austro-Hungarian Empire imploded. And so that idea of transnationality, that empire was the only one that could convey Jewish of different culture or different language, but they were united by being Jewish. And then we know what happened. So that's why I think Eros is so important that we as Jungian might want to look at the new myth of analysis as Eros, integrity, and psychagogia accompaniment. Very good, very good. <laughs> Shall we leave it, Bathian? 
No more questions. Lean, say something. No woman, no women spoke tonight. Please. And it's a pity. Microphone. Can someone help Lean to unmute? Raise the hand. Susan says it's a symptom. Okay. I'll ask her to unmute. She yeah. should be able to. Well, yes. this is the problem with uh, coming into the world in your late 70s. You don't even know where the hand is to raise. <laughs> Um, I love your proposition uh, for the new Jungian. Um, I would like to, uh, to have been born uh, beginning with the new Jungian. Uh, so there's a, a question of, of um, spending so much energy sort of disturbed by some of the old reified structures that have been developed in the analytic world, um, in the Jungian, not analytic, in the Jungian, um, I actually find it a problem that we are um, continually using the name of Jung for mm -hmm. so much. I mean, it's constricting. Uh, uh, there's this hierarchy in, in uh, the name, uh, the person, the concepts, the volumes of, of uh, as uh, Turnberg says, the, the blah, blah, blah. There's a lot that doesn't need to be learned. I know Stefano uh, and the Zurich School said first Jung. I don't even agree with that. Mm. I, I started learning about psyche through many, many avenues and many, many thinkers. And uh, most of them were men, but quite a few were women. And I just don't really see um, why, uh, I mean, it, I don't know what to say anymore. See, I, I, I lose my trend of thought. <laughs> but I, I do agree that there needs to be a, a new way of uh, conceiving ourselves. I, I think the octopus is as brilliant an animal mm -hmm. as uh, the human. Yeah. It's a I different know. animal. And the soul of the octopus is just as vibrant. So it's interesting you link the Austro-Hungarian Empire with the depth of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stefano. We see you again on the 15th of December with Roderick Main. Thank you.